much. This week we're on the now scene to Ramsgate in Kent, a town as English as fish and chips and as multi-layered in its history as a pickled onion. Lovely jubbly. Set on the Isle of Thanet and a stone's throw from the continent, Ramsgate has always been a popular place with the holiday visitor. In 55 BC, Caesar's legions came to look, liked it and stayed for ages. Then waves of Danes and Saxons laid out their beach towels whenever they saw the chance for a break. Throughout these interesting times, Ramsgate presented itself to the world as a small fishing village. But in the 18th century, a new and lucrative industry emerged. The whole area, with its secluded bays, hidden caves and tunnels, was a smuggler's paradise. Everyone was involved. Very few people considered it dishonest, and even fewer would dream of betraying the smugglers. When Daniel Defoe came to visit in 1723, it was suggested that he didn't ask too many questions or some serious ill might befall him. It was an offer he couldn't refuse. It was here in 1769 that the Battle of Botany Bay took place. The legendary bootlegger Joss Snelling and his gang were unloading the latest contraband when they were rudely interrupted by the revenue men. In the confusion, Snelling and four of his men broke away and raced up the cliffside. When they got to the top, a revenue officer was waiting for them. They shot him dead. But it wasn't a good day for the Snelling gang. At the end of the skirmish, ten of them lay dead on the beach. Another eight were arrested and faced the hangman's noose. In 1940, soldiers of the British Expeditionary Force were trapped on the beaches of Dunkirk. And the little boats of Ramsgate were about to play their part in Operation Dynamo, the greatest mass evacuation ever undertaken. On June the 1st, Commander Charles Herbert Lightoller, by an ironic stroke of fate, the most senior surviving officer from the Titanic, joined the flotilla in his motor yacht Sundowner, with his son Roger and an 18-year-old sea scout, Gerald Ashcroft. Sundowner had never carried more than 21 before. Now, Lightoller's guest list was 127, plus a crew of three. She was bursting at the seams, but despite bullet and bomb, Sundowner brought her precious cargo safely to Ramsgate. And today, she rests in the care of the Ramsgate Maritime Museum. And now it's all ashore to the Ramsgate Sports Centre to see what fascinating plunder the people of Thanet have brought to our experts. They're very smart, these Victorian shoes. Do you wear them? Yes, I do. I am um, at least twice a year. And they were given to me as a present on condition that I wore them. Sweet. And is the person around to check up whether you oh, are yes. wearing them? Oh, yes. Right. <laughs> yes, she is indeed. Oh, right. So you are obliged. Yes. But the, I suppose it's a sort of, it's a traditional court shoe, isn't it? But with a bit of um, glitterati on it, a bit of beadwork. And it's quite a contemporary shape, so it's no sort of trial to have to wear it. No, none whatsoever. It's beautifully comfortable to wear, and especially you, to dance in. To dance in. Yeah, to die for, to dance in standard court shoe like that yeah. maybe somebody would pay 10 or 20 pounds for them that sort of amount but what about this extraordinary handbag uh, is this something that you wear too not anymore <laughs> <laughs> yes he has been out but um i now feel it is time for him to retire but technically a handbag made out of an armadillo shell must be a very rare object. Well, I would have thought so, but um, the Victorians, I think, if you stood still long enough, they'd shoot you and turn you into a handbag, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've never seen an armadillo yeah. handbag, and, and it's an amazing thing. Um, and worth what? Well, I don't know, 50 pounds, perhaps. Oh, <laughs> 50 or 100 pounds. Oh, that's very... This is a rare thing, too. Tell me how it would have been used. With the hook on the on the back, which would go on to a your waistband, on, mm -hmm. yes, on your skirt, then this is a hook. So you put your wool onto here. And then when you weren't busy knitting or crochet, when your hands were doing something else, you would put your crochet hook into the middle and yes. you could adjust it the length down according to the length of your... Extraordinary, isn't it? Mm it's definitely continental. I mean, it might be Russian, it might be Polish, it might be one of those kind of countries. It's not marked apart from a tiny little, tiny little maker's initial. And um, people collect sewing accoutrements. I mean, they're popular. And this, I think, is extraordinarily rare. Today, you'd get probably four to six hundred pounds for it in a sale. My father-in-law made 
drinks cabinets for each of his three children. Yes. Um, but it is actually a commode. This is a wonderful conversion of a piece of furniture dating from the 1760s or 1770s. Lovely mahogany on the front, very good handles, which may be the original, they may be slightly later, but there's a good mark under there to show that that handle's been there for a very long time, and they're certainly of a style which is um, characteristic of the 1770s period. This originally would have had a ceramic pot in the middle of it, not this glass shelf, and it was, as you say, a commode stall. But as those things became redundant, most of them were thrown away. Some of them were actually converted into chests of drawers, which is really something spurious. Whereas this has retained its form and made it into something incredibly practical. Looking down inside, I can see you've made compartments for bottles and a shelf there for glasses and then a shelf for serving on. He did it all in such a way that the additions could be removed. Absolutely. But, I mean, what, what you have done is retained a very, very good piece of 18th century furniture and one which, in a sense, is as interesting for what's happened to it as it, as it would have been if it had just survived completely untouched. Mm. Well, despite the fact that it's been altered, I think it's something that would appeal to a true collector and to a connoisseur. Uh, and I would really suggest that a value for insurance on this of £4,000. It's, it's a really lovely yes. old English piece of furniture. Yes. Obviously, a role was to collect. I can recognise these without even looking at the marks. But uh, have yes. you had these long time? Um, that one I've held the longest. Um, bought that about 15 years ago. Yes. And the other items about uh, six or seven years mm. ago. So this is your oldest piece, what you I threw in your so. place, yes. I believe it so. It comes from the 1850s, um, Chamberlain's Worcester. Yes. You know, before they became raw Worcester yes. in title. And, oh, yes. uh, but beautifully made, and the handmade flowers all plied and stuck on. I mean, a little basket of flowers like that's going to be, what, around about um, 800 to 1,000, something like that. Oh, the, the, the king of the lot is this extraordinary um, uh, goat's head, centerpiece. Yes. It's, it, it's called in the, in the shape books a writon uh, after, uh, I, I suppose, a, a Greek or Roman shape yes. for, the, for the table. Um, whether one put flowers in it or reeds or rushes right. or something, um, but incredibly made so that you can see both sides. I mean, yes. you can see you've got the fruit oh, wow. on this side and um, these gorgeous flowers on this side um, painted by Frank Roberts. They're, they're signed, both, yes. both panels signed. Yes. Frank Roberts, a marvellous painter of flowers yes. and fruit. I mean, that's a beautiful panel, isn't it? Well, I found this in a, in a little shop in the Cotswolds and uh, the man was very busy, so I couldn't speak to him and we were in a hurry, so we had to go. But a year later, I went back and I couldn't believe my luck when it was still there. And then the chap told me how much he wanted for it, and I thought it was rather a lot, so I thought, well, I'll think about it. And I went back the next day, thought what I would pay, and he came up with the very same price, so that, that was it. Can you suggest what you paid for it? How much, did, how much I was I paid that? about 400 for it. 400 pounds? Yes. Is that all? Yes. And it's perfect? As far as oh, I know it is. Golly, yes, it looks absolutely perfect. Yes. I've never seen one as beautiful as this. I've seen the shape before, but not... Not so absolutely marvellous. So, heavens. Uh, Four to five thousand? Oh, my God. <laughs> Your few hundred was fantastic. I was drawn to the drama of the scene and the idiosyncratic colouring and the line in particular, and I discovered that Michael Ayrton was, first and foremost, um, interested in drawing, honed his skill through studying Dürer's woodcuts, and I see this etching here, beautifully detailed. And then the drama, the sweep of the yes. gulls, the well, wings of Buffon, the whole thing is lifted. It's got a lot of movement. I there, love the it? light against dark, dark against light. The whole thing is beautifully balanced yes. and poised. Just at the moment, I think the tide is on the turn, possibly. You think it's been ebbing, it's coming back I in? I think so. And yeah. for me, it captures the sort of ebb and flow of yeah. life. I don't think he's had the recognition mm. he deserves, really. Because what was he? I mean, he was a great critic. Yes. I mean, perhaps he's first and foremost, to some, remembered for being a great critic. Theatre uh, designer. Decades with The uh, Spectator as their leading critic, wasn't it? Yes. Theatre designer. Yes. 
and then uh, a sculptor in later Indeed, life. Indeed, yes. I think I can see that coming here with very the Very sculptural, he's isn't it? Yeah, in um, so many. You mean the way he's used the brush to leave those, um, those marks from the brush in the slabs of paint? Yes. And then he seems to have filled those with colour. That's not dirt. I don't think no, so. It's colour, I, don't isn't tell it? me to have it cleaned. No, I, I'm inclined not to. <laughs> I, I, I think cleaning pictures until you fully understand them is a very exactly. dangerous thing to do. I'm, now, this one, if you've cleaned all that off, I think mm. you may be losing quite a lot I of what the artist so. wants to I put across so. a certain yes. gloominess, a certain uh, twilight uh, mood, you know. But I, I love the way these seagulls come out of, it, almost like bits of seaweed or, or bits of drift wood on, yes, the, on, the, on the tide. Organics are growing out of it. And, yeah. and uh, I think the whole thing's very moody and very, very 50s colour, but it's actually dated 1946. But at this moment in time, I believe that he was very highly regarded, much more so than any of his peers. He was seen as, the, as, as a, a, the great white hope of British painting. Um, how does he rate now? Because one doesn't hear quite so much about it. Less so, less so. Yes. I mean, it's probably reflected in the value of the picture. I mean, what did you pay for it? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah. No, I paid £250. Yes. About 25 years ago. Mm. Well, an auction estimate might be six to £8,000. But I think uh, the correct price for this picture ought to be closer to 15. I think worth every penny. Um, I haven't finished looking at it myself yet. There's a lot to come, <laughs> isn't there? It's a there very is. complicated picture, and yes. it's going to reward for years. It's a very intelligent years. picture. Very intelligent. I think one, one can spend 20 it's years layered, and more it? looking mm. at it, and I certainly intend to do that. I must say, I'm not aware of forensic evidence appearing on the road show before now. So what are these dental x-rays for? Well, we were intrigued by the fact that if you look in the neck, you can see some glass wear. Right. And uh, reluctant to try and take the heads off, I asked my dentist very kindly if he would take x-rays of them, which he did. And as you can see, the results. So you needed to know really whether it was... Yes, yeah. yes I was curious. Yeah. Now, the only way we're going and to see it... they are anyway, what are Is that the right way up? Yes, it is, yes. yes. So we've got the, bo the bottom half where we can see the, the pin yes. in the legs. But here, right in the middle of it, we can see that there is a, a scent bottle. That's right, yes. There's a hollow tube running is down the middle of the... I think it is, an actual perfume bottle. I'm sure yes. it is. And it's made by a firm called Shuko. And um, does, does the yellow one have the same as well? I think it does, yes. I must confess, I haven't looked at the x-rays for some time. It, oh, it yes. does, yes, yes it, does. it does. It's, it's also a yes. little scent bottle. But Schuko, is that a German? Schuko, that's right, yes. And of course they made all sorts of toys and novelties. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, from the 30s right through to the 60s. Yes. And how long have you had them? Many years, but I haven't a clue where they came from. Really? And I have thrown them out two or three times and recovered them because they are so dainty. Well, you've actually got you them know. in the bin and then fished them out again? Um, yes, I really? have. Yes, I have. Gosh, yes. well, I'm jolly glad you yes. did. Um, if you were to sell them uh, now, you would probably get somewhere between two and three hundred pounds for the bigger one, and around about a hundred to one hundred and fifty pounds for the smaller oh one. So I'm so glad you didn't throw them yes. in the bin. Well, you and I know what this is, but to all yes. intents and purposes, most people looking would just think it's an elephant. But here's the missing piece, which we pop on his trunk, and it turns it into a mystery timepiece. Do you know roughly when they were made? Um, no, I'm afraid. I have no idea. They're made in Germany. About oh, Germany? Yep. Yeah, uh, well, just before the start of the First War, about 1910, very mm -hmm. roughly. Uh, and they made various models. The elephant is very prolific. There's a kangaroo. And there are various figures. There's a figure of Diana. There's a slightly rarer figure of Cleopatra, who is really? rather tall and scantily clad. And then the biggest of them all is a, what we call the bat and ball boy. He's got oh. a bat in one hand and he's got the clock. Would they have the same, similar sort of They clock? all had exactly the same of this mystery movement. Really? Yeah. And this particular one, I'll just stop it briefly, they're made by the factory of Jungens, as I say, a German factory, and they made quite a number. We don't know how many, and of course a lot of them would have been destroyed, yeah. particularly in the Second War. Is it something you had an awfully long time or not? Um, well, it, it was in a house that was um, actually full of junk. And uh, my son inherited it and sorting through bits of pieces. And yeah. this was just one of the things that, you know, took his fancy. Cool. What a dream. I so, wish I could find this in a box <laughs> of junk. I love it. So he obviously has no idea of its value. 
Uh, no, none at all. Not well, you can tell him that even in the rough like this, if he put that to auction at the moment, it would fetch about £650. Really? By the time it's cleaned and overhauled, I sell these for about £1,250 each. That's in top retail condition. Very collectible. People love these elephants. Well, I thought this might amuse you, Michael, since we're in Ramsgate. We've got a souvenir from the Victorian period, or just after. What a lovely thing. In fact, I know this bit because that's the what was then the new lighthouse, and we, we walked around it yesterday while we were filming the, the local environs. Really? Yeah. yeah. So, interesting. And this one's got the railway station on it, and bathing machines, which they pushed you out into, so your modesty wasn't... You, you didn't have to walk into the water. Yes. So the men wouldn't see you in your all over dress and you wouldn't see yourself either that was important. that was important very important yeah. absolutely so this it, made made where well bizarrely enough it was made in germany and this is actually about 1910 somewhere around there wherever we go we will find nearly always a german local souvenir fascinating um they're not enormously valuable but this is actually of its kind quite a good one i would think probably around 60 80 pounds something like that because you've got the cup and the sauce yeah where did it come Just from? A, an old aunt who died and we cleared her house about 15 years ago. That's, that's basically it. I know nothing about it. It's a nice little tin and mm. strangely enough I don't think it was ever made to hold biscuits. I think this one is made just like a biscuit tin but actually it's a string box. Right. And inside you'd have a ball of string, take out the piece of string through that little oh, hole right, yeah. and have a sharp blade on the top. And you take mm. out the piece of string and pull off a length and sever mm. it on the blade which is missing on the right. top. Mm. A bit of social history. And a, a, a biscuit tin collector I think would pay about £40 for that. All oh, right. When I was a little boy, I used to collect pennies. And of course, you'd put them all in day's order and there'd always be gaps. And one of the gaps, of course, is 1933. And every little boy wanted to have a 33 penny and they never found one. So how could you have a 33 penny when only eight or nine are known to exist? Well, I go to craft fairs and I actually picked it up in a, a small bag of coins, which I sort of look through and uh, I couldn't believe my luck, but... Uh, well, of course, if one's a sort of doubting Thomas, we start on that basis. Yeah. How would you fake it? One of the ways you could fake a, a 33 penny is to have uh, a 38 penny and you, you cut little bits off the 8 to turn it into a 3. That would look great on this side, but the problem is it would be the wrong king because 33 was George V and 38 is George VI. So you'd have the wrong king on a 33 penny, so that's no use at all. No. The other thing is that uh, apparently you could have um, an Australian 33 penny. What, would which, it be the same? Well, I mean, no, it, was... it wouldn't be the same on both sides. Oh, so right. the head, you would have to put an English head on an Australian penny. How would you do that? Oh, I don't know. Well, I have no you'd idea. have to cut it down the middle and, oh, and put the two halves together, and it would look a bit like a hamburger and you'd have a line down the middle. And this, oh. this one has not got that line, so it's not an Australian penny with a, an that English head on it. On so we know that much. Oh, right. Obviously, it's not a 38 penny, no. so that's OK. Now, there are ways of, of fiddling with the, with the numbers, but both those two threes look incredibly similar. Right. So the next question is, is it a fake? One fake, or roughly one fake a year, does turn up. So, oh, you know, this could be this yes, year's fake. Yes, yes. And that being the case, it's going to be worth 20, 30 pounds is a thing that mm. even, yes, you know, yes. collectors would want to have because oh, it would fill a gap yes, even if it's not the right one. Yeah. But even if it's a fake? Well, yeah, because, I mean, there aren't that many fakes, oh, so right. it's, it's not a common thing. Yes, However, if it's right, and I think, you know, we have to say if, mm. and, but if it is right, it's going to be worth somewhere between 20 and 25,000 mm. pounds as a minimum mm. at auction. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, you know, it would be well worth um, a ticket to uh, the right man to check it out. Oh, right. This is my husband's, or rather his grandfather's. So it's been in the family for the best part of, what, 60, 80 years? Yes, that's right. OK. It's a lovely little enamel plaque. Um, I know it looks, uh, to all intents and purposes, rather like a, a watercolour, or, or even an oil painting, having said that, um, because it's got a lovely depth to it. And the great thing about it, by the way, is that you can have this in daylight, 
for as yeah. long as you like, and those colours will not fade, because this is basically glass paste, yes. which is painted on uh, onto a copper um, copper base. So those colours are as fresh as the day it came out of um, uh, out of the kiln. But this um, this panel started off life possibly in a town called Bilston, because um, this was the centre during the 18th century uh, for the um, enamel trade. Date-wise, I think you're looking at around about 1770, maybe 1780s. In the case of this plaque, now I'm saying plaque because there's every chance that it may have been the lid to a box, that it may have been set in a hinge mount, and, and actually what you're looking at is the cover to a box. But let's just look at the composition, because your, your, your eyes led into it. First of all, in the foreground, I love that spotted dog. Yeah. Um, and that lovely tree, fabulous tree. Um, and this rather exaggerated spire uh, of the church. It's, th it's almost three-dimensional, isn't it? Yeah. If you just look at the surface, you can see how it's given that three-dimensional effect, because it's, the, the enamel is slightly raised. Yes. Well, if it was mine, um, I would certainly have it on my contents list for a figure of around about £1,000. Because really? I know full well that that would be the sort of figure that I would probably have to pay if I went to a specialist dealer to yes. replace it yes. today. Do you know anything of the history of the chair? I know that my grandmother bought it at auction in Wales, I believe, mm. and we think she paid ten and six for it. And when was that? Oh, years and years, years and years, and years ago. ago. I mean... Well, it's a very nice chair. It's not Welsh. No. Um, the design is typical of French Empire furniture, mm -hmm. dating from around 1800 to 1810. And this sort of form, which is much stiffer than the English Regency equivalent, mm -hmm. it's more serious, mm. whereas the, the English Regency furniture tends to be a little bit more frivolous. Mm. Now, whoever recovered this chair, because that's not the first tapestry. It was obviously very sensitive to the chair itself. It's very beautifully done. It's actually my grandmother, my Belgian grandmother, and my mother. My grandmother taught my mother how to do tapestry, and they did one each. Well, it's so. very beautifully done, and I think it enhances the chair. But let's just turn it upside down and see what we can see underneath it. Go okay, slide on its back. So, you've got a very, very nice old, dry beach frame. Sometimes these chairs, when they're made in Paris, have a, a maker's mark stamped on the frame, which this one does not appear to have. Also, very often these chairs are made with the corners pegged together, not with a brace going across as this All one's right. got. Yeah. But this is a lovely original feature with iron nails going into it, and obviously reupholstered here when it's been recovered. Yes. So what I think we're looking at is a chair made on the continent of Europe, within the first 10 or 15 years of the 19th century. It's something that ought to be insured for £3,000. <laughs> and it's jolly nice. Giddy, aren't Time now to look at this week's archive clips. Remember, we're asking you to choose the items that we'll include in the last programme of the series to celebrate our 25 years on the road. And this week, we're talking about those bargain buys. <laughs> What happened is when I was first married, I lived in a uh, flat in Croydon. Right. And one day, the old lady who was living next door to us came and knocked on the door and asked my husband if he would help the dustman down with this old desk. So I thought, it was well, that's the whole papers. That's it. What a wonderful story. Well, it's, it's George II, late George I period desk. Oh. Oh, yes. Oh, oh yes. yes. Oh, yes, definitely. And do tell me where you got it. It was actually at a car boot sale um, in Exeter, soaked it in some um, water and washing up liquid, and it's been beside my bed. There's a mark under here, which is the Imperial Eagle, which shows that it came from a shop patronised by the Imperial family in Russia. I can't swear, can I? <laughs> Henrietta Ronner has been described as the queen of the cat painters. It's a family picture? No, um, it's my sister's picture, and she got it from a boot sale. Does she think it was worth anything? Or is it just the cat? I doubt it. It's just that it had cats on it. Probably thought it was a chocolate box frame. Well, it is an original painting, uh, which is 
very beautiful. Well, I think it's obvious what it is. It's a, it's a tiny miniature potty, um, a little chamber pot. Um, I, I suppose for a little doll's house or a little child's miniature service. Yes. How, how long have you had it? About two months. About two months? Yes. It's not a family piece. No. Uh, how did you acquire it? I bought it at a car boot sale. The car boot sale? Yes. But I've never yet come across a, a complete little calfly toy chamber pot. So to register your vote, ring 08700 100 870. And when you hear the prompt, press 1, 2, 3 or 4 on your telephone keypad, depending on your choice. Alternatively, you can see the clips again in full on our website and vote online at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash antiques. Four more clips for you to see next time. Now back to the experts. Johnny. Johnny, just in the same suit, but looking slightly different. A much younger one, signed John. The same suit again, except this one isn't signed at all. Another one, surrounded by garden debris, I suppose you'd call it. And this one, looking nonchalant in a sailor's suit, signed Johnny. I've never seen so many photographs of Prince John, the youngest son of George V and Queen Mary. Why have you got them? I have them because my great uncle was riding master, groom and uh, king's messenger and lived at Sandringham where my mother lived with him for many years through her childhood and early teenage years. Tell me, what sort of relationship did your mother have with Prince John for him to send her so many pictures, signed photographs? They were childhood friends. His um, nurse, Mrs Bill, who was known as Lala, uh, encouraged him to have friends and there were lots of children on the estate and my mother shared many times with him cycling around the estate on bicycles and they would go for rides together in the pony and trap and generally have many happy times together. The other thing which I have to say I think is, is quite outstanding and I don't think I've seen another letter of his and that is this letter here from York Cottage in Sandringham and it says, Dear Mr. Strato, Strato, Straton. I know it's yes. Mr. Stratton, but he's left the N off. I hope your arm is better. Are you going to charge <laughs> uh, with my love from John? I think that's a lovely letter. What happened to, what happened to his arm? Oh, my uncle had an accident and broke his arm riding and had oh, well, to I recuperate that's, a little that, bit. That, that, that's absolutely <laughs> splendid. He had a rather sad childhood, didn't he? You say he had a nice childhood, but he, but he, was, he was ill. He was. He had a medical condition which couldn't be well controlled in those days. Mm. Yes. This stuff is, you know, it's, it's, it's a, I can't believe that I can actually see quite so much of it. The little sign John is here. They're going to be in the region of £400 each, four or £500 each. The boldly signed John there, probably £600, £700. The letter. They are incredibly rare, incredibly rare. That, I think, has to be about sort of 12 to 1,500 pounds. And this, one of my favorite uh, photographs of the two young kings <laughs> there, uh, Prince Albert, George VI, and Edward, who became Edward VIII. I think that's absolutely, um, absolutely wonderful. That's got to be about six or 700 pounds as well. You've got so many wonderful things here that I know that the value it passes you by completely. I can tell by your expression yes, yes. that you couldn't care less because you're not going to get rid of this yeah, material. I like this. Really? Yeah, I do. I think it's a pretty plaque. Excellent. Um, this is made of earthenware. Surely, yeah. And they were made in quite large numbers in the 1870s through the 1880s. Mm -hmm. It was the time of the aesthetic movement. Right when we were influenced by Japan. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and you had beautiful ladies dressed up in sort of semi-Japanese uh, crossed with early 19th century dress. It was right. most weird. Yeah, yeah. And they were called stunners. And she's a stunner. Now, many of them were painted by amateurs, sure. often very gifted amateurs. Mm -hmm. Women went to evening classes and they learned to paint on pottery and porcelain. Right. Um, and this may well have been copied from a, uh, from a, um, a print in a magazine or something oh, like really? that. It's signed down here, Florence Judd. I don't know the name. And the date, 1881, I think it right, is. Right, yes. Um, but it's well done. Yes. These are often not that well done. Right. 
on the back, we've got an original paper label. Mm -hmm. We've got our name up here. Yes. Again, F. Judd. Yes. Um, and this is Howell and James. And this was a competition. And you entered your prize painting right. on pottery or porcelain. Really? Almost, actually, almost invariably pottery, not porcelain. Sure. Um, and you could, you could sell it or you could win a, a prize. And this one was on sale for £16. A lot of money then. Uh, an awful lot of money. Awful lot. It was obviously highly rated. Where did it come from? My partner was given it some years ago, in fact, quite a few years ago. She had it for many years. It was in the north of England. And then it was handed on to her uncle. Now, he had it for numerous years, and he died a short while ago, and it was finally handed back to her. Other than that, I know very little about right, it. Right, and you have it hanging up at home? Yes. <laughs> I ask that because it's extraordinary how often, on this programme, you ask the person whether they like it, and they don't like it at all. You wonder why on earth they've got it. I like it. You do yeah, like it. He likes <clears> it, yes. <throat> Quite right, too. I think it's a very likeable object. Um, and very saleable. Um, I think that would make probably in the region of 800 to 1,000 pounds. Really? Excellent. Very nice indeed. You don't come from France, do you? I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is strange enough. This is Lyon, 1894. Yes. You're not from Lyon. Yes, my parents, all the family is from Lyon, Vienne. Really? Yes. Well, because this little box, if you'd gone to the equivalent of the Dome in 1894 in Lyon, you'd have taken away a little box like oh, this. Oh, I see. Because the image on the top, which is behind glass, and if you look at it, it's all shiny underneath the surface there, yes. where they put a bit of silver foil underneath oh. the glass. Um, you'd have put a little piece of jewellery or your favourite object inside to keep it safe. Popped it on your dressing table. Quite cheaply made out of stamped yes. metal, mm -hmm. but delightful little object, and it's yeah. probably worth, I don't know, perhaps £60, pounds, something like that. Oh, £60, £60, £40 to £60. Pounds. Nice. Lovely, then. Thank you very much. So, tell me, how did you actually come by this walking stick? I bought a house in 1951, and the lady cleared everything except that. This is, so this is the only thing left behind in the house. Mm. It's actually what we call scrimshaw, which is, and it's something that would have been carved on board ship by a sailor, probably in the 1850s, uh, on a whaling ship. And the most important thing about these is that the sailors just had so much time on their hands, you know, countless days just spent at sea doing not very much. Um, and so whoever it was carved this wonderful um, piece of what we call scrimshaw and managing to carve little holes in here and this bit is very much like a, a lace bobbin of the sort of 1850s, 1860s and that's how we, we can date it. The other nice part of it is this tiny little lozenge of tortoise shell there. So wherever the whaling ship went it must have gone into warm waters as well where there were actually turtles so it could have gone as far south as Bermuda and as far north as, as, as the Arctic. So, have you any idea what you think it might be worth? None at all. No. I thought of giving it to charity a few times. Oh, well, I think charity starts at home, because I think fully cleaned up and restored, it's something that we'd be looking at around about 800 to 1,000 pounds. Good so not bad for something that got left behind in a house. Nothing, yes. This is a splendid mid-19th century, best quality hunting rifle. Do you know, do you know which country it comes from? I've got an idea, but I'm not absolutely sure. Swiss, Austrian? Yeah, I, I, I go with either of those. Anywhere within the sort of Germanic world. It, it's very, very typical of the rifles that they used for hunting boar, deer and, and chamois. Right. It, it has two triggers because its precision is so great that when you cock the lock and you're ready to shoot, yeah. you pull that back trigger and it sets the lock so that it's the hammer is just sitting on the edge of it and as soon as you touch the first one it goes off and that makes for very accurate shooting it's called double set triggers and it's very very typical of continental firearms where they wanted great precision if you, if you were shooting over quite a long distance at say a chamois on a rock that's probably the only opportunity you're going to get all day and you didn't really want to miss it uh, so it's an aid to accurate shooting it's a rather heavy as well German firearms are always big, chunky things. They're, they're, they're practical and very, very much made for use. But this is also beautifully decorated. You can see that it's got um, little gold inlaid animals on there and also on the barrel, this silver. The lock mechanism's got this safety catch as well, which acts as another 
feature to tell you that it's, it's of the very finest quality. And also, if we look down here, there's a little box in there. Do you know what that's for in there? I expect that was for the powder. No, not for the powder, for the linen patches which they wrap the bullet in. And that made it engage with the rifling grooves which are cut down the inside of the barrel. And that made the ball spin as it came out. It made it very, very accurate. And it's also got a very interesting rear sight on it, which is actually adjustable, both for elevation, for the, the height, bit, and also for windage, which is the right and left. Oh, right. So that's another feature that tells you that it's a very, very high-quality piece. The bit that I like best about it is this wonderful carving down there. Very typical cheek piece. You always get them on German farms. It gets your head up and makes you look down the line of the barrel. But they've just the wood is so good and so tight that they've just carved that lovely hunting scene in there where there's a chap with his mate and a couple of dogs out for a day's hunting. And he's obviously been successful because he's got a roebuck slung right. over his bag. So have you any idea what it's worth? No, not really. No, no. It's um, a great deal to me. <laughs> in sentimental terms. It's, a, it's, yeah. sentimental terms. Well, it's also worth a not inconsiderable amount of money, about three to four thousand pounds. Oh, it's well. a lovely, lovely thing. Tell me, what do you know about these? I know very little about them. They were left to me by my late brother, and all I do know is that he thought they were from the Dutch East India Company and we come from South Africa, and my brother lived in Cape Town. If you and he thought there might have been a Dutch East India Company link, presumably you think you know that they're Chinese, do you? I have no idea where they come no. from, <laughs> nothing at all. Right. They are Chinese. Okay. They're Chinese. Um, and they are based on English silver originals of about 1720, right? But actually, these date from about 1760. So they were copying something which was out of date by 30, 40, 50 years even, maybe. But they are 1760. They're quite rare survivors. Really? Another interesting point about this, when the Chinese model this or cast it uh, or mold it, um, they fire it in the kiln, take it out, glaze it and fire it at full temperature. The first firing is just to harden it off. And normally, nothing happens at that first hardening up off stage. But this one has split. Now, normally, you chuck it away. But this cost, in Chinese terms, quite a lot of money to make. It's a complicated object. So rather than dump it, they filled it with glaze and fired it. Right? So it then comes down, it's taken from Qing to Chen, where it's uh, made and glazed, all the way down to Canton, where the decoration is put on. Okay. And this would have been done specially to European taste, and I think French taste. I think this is Company de Zand, made for the French market. Okay. Beautifully decorated, hand painted in Fami Rose enamels unusual with this iron red band of stiff leaves around here not common at all they are apart from that firing crack which doesn't count they're in perfect condition you like them do um i'm not mad about them but they're How sentimental not mad? well they've got sentimental value so they they are very special well the thing about way. sentimental value is that you offer enough that it will overcome it possibly <laughs> Two thousand pounds? No. Three thousand. No. Okay, no. that's as hard as I can get. Yeah. Well, maybe three and a half. No, I think I would rather, rather because of the them. memory of my brother. Yes. Well, it's a nice thing to remember him by. I think they're utterly, utterly charming, and you're very, very lucky. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. You are obviously quite a fan of Louis Wayne. Look at them. Tell me about this one. This is the one that my mother bought for just a matter of a few shillings at, a, at an auction. No one knew what it was. Um, she recognised it as Louis, Louis Wayne. And um, that was the one that really inspired me to, to collect more. The one that kicked it off? Yes. I know that he's much, much copied and much faked, and yet I think this one's fine. It's got an honesty about it, but if it's right, it's got to be really very early, don't you think? It seems to me 
different from the rest of them, which are much more stylized, much more, much stronger. I love this oil painting. I mean, uh, th th this cat has uh, quite a lot of character, hasn't he? I think they should be in the boardroom of many direct, you know, many no, You think he is a director, don't you? It's <laughs> very anthropomorphic, isn't it? It's, it's just so human. Uh, and what, what about this? Tell me about that. This is called Peter's first illness, yes. but Peter was his first cat, and um, I, I thought it, it, it portrays all the images of illness in a human, and yeah. <laughs> you feel, feel for the poor cat just looking at him. So it's really quite early too, yes, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Well then, let's have a look at some of the uh, illustrations that you've brought with you that are unframed here. There's a, a story I like to see, whether it's true or not. Um, when Louis Wayne went, went to some tea party, he was yeah. asked what, what he'd like to drink, and he said, well, just a saucer of milk. <laughs> whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it's a lovely story. <laughs> <laughs> he obviously had a sense of humour, uh, very definitely. These are extraordinary, aren't they? I found it very interesting that... Um, well, he, he, he went mad in around the 1920s, and he was found in um, dire poverty in one of the asylums by a reporter. And the uh, Prime Minister, I think it was Ramsay MacDonald at the time, and H.G. Wells made a, an appeal on his behalf on the radio to raise money to put him in uh, better conditions. And, uh, uh, and that, was, that was accomplished, wasn't it? Yes. yes. And this one, I think, is one of the oddest. There's something really quite disturbed about that. Difficult to put one's finger on, and yet it is. Don't you agree? I think it's the large eyes. <laughs> yes, it really. Ooh. Anyway, <laughs> what about values? Have you any idea? Well, that's it. I, I, I've been reading about Louis Wayne, but I, since, since I bought these in um, 1975, that um, I think I paid 100 and, about 150 for this, and 200 for the rest. Yeah, the, the, the 22. Um, yes, 22 of these. These, I think. Uh, Claire, one of his sisters, um, when they came up for auction. Yeah, yeah. That was 25 years ago, so I have no idea how things have um, changed. Well, since I then. can give you some idea of that. I mean, um, these 22 things, well, um, they're going to average out at uh, probably 1,000, 1,500 pounds each, that sort of thing. Gosh, I didn't realize that. But this very strange one here, worth quite a lot more, perhaps. And then when we come to these other ones, if I'm right and this is an early one, then it being such a collector's market, Louis Wayne, um, and it is an early one and it turns out to be an important one, and certainly we know that this is his own cat, Peter, in this case here, well then these two pictures, um, probably 1,500, 2,000, um, perhaps uh, 2,500 for that one, and this one, this oil painting, well, it's probably worth about three, maybe four thousand pounds. Getting uh, on for thirty thousand altogether. Probably is, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And also, I think I have to tell you, I might have been a bit conservative. They could be worth more, especially with that provenance. Yes. I look after them now. <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> well, another day of treasures revealed and some questions answered. I did like the line of the lady who said she had her painting for 20 years and still hadn't finished looking at it. You can have another look at it and all the other treasures on our website.